Hello, everyone, and welcome to our DC Pro Bono Week event, meeting our clients where they are serving families east of the river. This event is co-hosted by Children's Law Center and Bread for the City. As Pro Bono Director at Children's Law Center, I oversee our volunteer program, and I'll talk a little bit further about that during today's presentation. I want to turn it over now to our other presenters who you'll be hearing from today. Hi, I'm Kathy Zizel. I'm a senior supervising attorney at Children's Law Center. And in non-COVID times, I'm our on-site attorney at the Children's National Health Center at Anacostia. Hello, everybody. My name is Hope Rhodes. I'm a community pediatrician and the associate medical director at Children's Health Center at The Arc, and have worked very closely with uh, Kathy Zizel over the past 10 years. Kenrick, are you there? Hi, how are you? I'm Kenrick Thomas. I'm the Communications and Events Manager for Bread for the City. And lastly, I'm Susie Ju. I'm the Legal Director at Bread for the City. Thank you everyone so much for joining us today. So just a brief roadmap. I'm gonna give a very brief introduction to this presentation, and then you'll hear specifics about Children's Law Center's medical legal partnership and the work that we're doing east of the river. And you'll hear from our friends at Bread for the City about their work respectively east of the river. We'll close out talking about our pro bono opportunities at both organizations, and we'll offer you time off the recording if you're joining us live to engage in question and answer with our, present, with our presenters today. So first I wanna start by noting, but for the pandemic, similar to Kathy's remark, we would be inviting you to join us east of the river in the communities we're serving to come out and see some of our medical clinics, to be able to take tours of these facilities and see where we're meeting clients um, in their communities and serving them in multiple ways. Who do we serve? We predominantly serve black and brown communities living in poverty in the district. And you'll see in this map that that concentration is happening east of the river in wards seven and eight. When we are thinking about the issues that are impacting our clients, you may have read on the prior slide, the intersection of race and poverty. You'll see on this slide many issues that are impacting the clients we serve. Um, issues like racism, poverty, and trauma that may be impacting a client's daily life and functioning and other areas that may be more or less uh, pressing in their lives at the time that we meet them or during the course of our work with them. It may be childcare, it may be domestic violence, health, or any other issue on this wheel. Um, ultimately, we are considering our clients um, holistically and we're talking today about how we can bring lawyers and non-legal professionals together to meet those needs most successfully. In terms of the framework of need in DC and thinking about just a few snapshot statistics about poverty in the district, you'll see here, and of course, Children's Law Center focuses on children and families. So we've included some indicators for children. Uh, one in five residents in DC are living in poverty and that's one in four children. You'll see 23% of residents relying on food stamps, whereas 35% for children, 35 of children are relying on that as their main source of nutrition. Um, the need is stark and this is impacting, again, the daily functioning of our clients and these are the things that we're thinking about when we're serving them. At Children's Law Center, we of course, practice in the areas of family, health, and education. And today we will be digging into that health piece as we talk about our medical legal partnership. Um, but ultimately we're fighting so each G DC child can grow up with a stable family, good health and a loving education, excuse me, good health and a, and a quality education. And so I'll talk a little bit about the different pro bono opportunities we have for all of those areas, because we do rely on our pro bono volunteers in order to serve over 5,000 children and families each year. So as we think about the medical legal partnership, you're gonna hear now from Kathy and Hope about um, some of the examples of that work and what that model looks like at Children's Law Center. So I'm so excited to see so many people on the call because I think one advantage of doing it virtually is a lot more people can join than are able to come. I want to say one thing explicitly because we keep saying across the river, but you guys didn't get to come across the river, so you may not even know what river we're talking about. Um, if you had gotten to come in person, you would have known we're talking about the Anacostia River, um, which separates Ward 7 and 8. Um, Alyssa, can you go back just one slide really quickly? Or two slides, sorry, to that map really quickly? or whoever's controlling the PowerPoint, whether it's Alyssa or Jen, I'm not sure. Um, 
But if you look, or if you went back and looked at that map, you would have seen Ward 7 and 8 are two wards which we're talking about serving DCs divided into eight wards. And Ward 7 and 8 are, as Jen was saying, the two lowest income wards, and they're physically separated from the rest of DC by that Anacostia River. So um, when we're talking about like the areas of need in DC, we're talking about the two lowest income wards of DC, those wards seven and eight that are physically separated from DC. And if you look back at the history of DC, there's a lot of reason for that. Um, a lot of structural racism that led to that. But you can see here that this is physically this river that you would have crossed had you been able to come to our clinics today and to the bread for the city center that is across the river, you would have seen that those are physically across the river that separates Ward 7 and 8 into the lowest poverty areas of DC and the areas of highest um, social and legal need of DC. So that's part of why we do this presentation across the river every year. So some of you may have never been across the river and we invite you in once COVID is over to come across the river to our clinics and see them, our, our centers and see them in person or you can you feel free to drive there anytime. But, um, but that's why we do this presentation every year. So um, the medical legal partnership, you might be like, what's that? I've never heard of it. So a medical legal partnership was actually born out of frustration on the pediatrician side. And this gentleman you see right here is Dr. Barry Zuckerman at Boston and Children's Hospital. And he was the pediatrician who, the first pediatrician to put it into practice. In, a, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and it was this idea that pediatricians kept seeing things in the medical side that couldn't be solved by doctors, but were impacting children's health. And they said, you know, these are really legal issues. Children don't have insurance. The housing conditions are impacting children. Um, just lots of things that we as pediatricians, and he was a pediatrician, want to solve for children, but we can't do it. Um, so what we need to do is add a lawyer to the treatment team on site here. And so if you go to the next slide, sorry, I'm not controlling it. Like, oh. um, and actually keep going to the next one. What we, what we, oh no, go back. Sorry, we cut the other one. Sorry, guys, I'm not controlling it. Um, go back one more. What we developed is a framework. Um, sorry, guys, it's really annoying to have to go back. Um, what we developed um, as an MLP framework is this idea that people come into their community health center and should see a lawyer. And what's great about the MLP model is that lawyers are in the community and can be seeing in the community and um, that lawyers can then um, can then um, be getting the um, can, can be getting these referrals directly from pediatricians, which on the pediatrician side means a lawyer can help solve the medical needs. Now from the lawyer side, it works really well because you may have heard this, but people don't always love lawyers. We don't have a great reputation sometimes. And it lets us go like maybe 10 meetings into trusting somebody because they do love their pediatrician. And when their pediatrician says, here's a lawyer you can trust, people come into that meeting being like, hey, my pediatrician says you can help me with something. And they may not even know it's a legal issue. Like my pediatrician says you can help me get my insurance back on, or my pediatrician says you can help me get my landlord to get these roaches out of my house or whatever it is that the pediatrician has told them is hurting their kid's health. And that lets us really get in well with the families in a way we might not be able to. It lets us be physically in the community where the patients are coming all the time. And if you've ever tried to get a doctor on the phone, sorry, Hope, but if you've ever tried to get a doctor on the phone, it's really, really, really hard. And we're literally like my office is next to the exam room. So I can go and say, hey, Hope, they, I'm hearing that this kid is being impacted by this. Does that sound right to you? Or what do you recommend as a doctor that we ask for from the insurance company? Like, can you sign this letter that we need for reasonable accommodation? And they're like, yeah, 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 I'm right here. I'll sign it. So it works really, really well as a model. Okay, so if you go to the next slide, um, there's over 200, there's over 300 medical legal partnerships, this is a little bit of an old slide, um, across the country. They're not all pediatric. They can be veterans, they can be in hospitals, some serve just cancer patients, but this has been a model that's working really, really, really well throughout the country. Um, oh, this is the slide that I thought was next, but there we go. So you can see sort of this model, people come into the medical, they see the legal on site, um, or there's a lawyer associated with particular health centers, okay? You can go to the next one, there's some funny animation. So Children's Law Center started our medical legal partnership with Children's National in 2001, and so we've been around there for a while. I've been on site at Anacostia for 12 years now. And we have with Children's National, we're on site with the main hospital, those soon to be moved off there as their, their primary care moves off site. Um, 
but we're partnered with the Generations Program, which is the teen parenting program, teen, well, teen parenting prevention program. Um, with Anna Castia, with the ARC, where Hope is now the Associate Medical Director, um, and with um, their Impact DC Emergency Asthma Room Program. We're also at Mary Center, which is a federally qualified health center um, at their Fort Totten location, and they serve mostly immigrants, mostly Spanish speakers, um, though also other immigrants. Um, and most of our cases at kind of Mary Center are Spanish speakers. And we're also at Unity Healthcare, which serves, they do serve both adults and children, but we, we do get pediatric referrals there at Unity Minnesota Avenue and Unity Upper Cardozo, which is um, next to the Target on 14th Street. Um, so for our sites across the river, across the Anacostia, we're at Anacostia, the Children's National Anacostia, the ARC, and at Unity Minnesota Avenue. So we have three sites across the river where community members are able to come see us on site, bring documents, um, and about 60% of our cases are in our clients who live in Ward 7 and 8. Okay. In FY 2018, and this was almost the same last year as well, we helped about 3,000 children and families. We got about 1,400 referrals. So almost all of those referrals come from our medical partners. So in contrast to what you're gonna hear about bread from the city, like they get referrals from all over, community members kind of walk in. Most of our referrals, the vast majority, are from our medical partners making referrals to our attorneys rather than community members like coming in for cold intakes or calling our in an intake line or something like that. Almost 60% of the children we work with, our, our families we work with are from Ward 7 and 8. And we also, in addition, as a medical legal partnership, do a lot of training. We train our medical partners to be able to spot red flags so they can make good referrals to us because they don't know what to look for otherwise. We train families on their rights. Um, we actually do like pop-up trainings in the lobbies when the lobbies are full to do know your rights trainings. We do a lot of community trainings. We do these kinds of trainings for other people. Um, last week I trained for the State Board of Education on school residency issues. So we do those kinds of trainings. And then we also um, do research and evaluation work. And then we take that work and we do, because we see so many individual cases, we also try to use that work to do policy work and say, hey, we're, we're working with so many individual families, but we learn a lot about what needs to change systemically in DC. You know, we see that the mental health services in DC don't work well. How can we do better? We see that when I was in, you know, for years at Anacostia, I saw paint trucks drive by that say, hey, we also do mold remediation. We have to paint over your mold for you, for landlords. That doesn't fix your mold. Let's do something about that. Um, so lots of things where we learn from cases that do what doesn't work for families on the ground and how can we change that in a systemic way. Okay. And this sort of talks about how all of that works together as one big organization and one big project because we want to make sure that everything we're doing is working really client focused and working to help families in the district. And then this you can just see the referrals and how they break out. So I wanted to we wanted to show you this because it gives you a sense of kind of like what kinds of cases we get actually over last year was a little higher in housing but probably about 60 percent of our referrals are education related if you read the papers about dc's education system there's still a lot of a lot going on there most of those are special education referrals so kids with disabilities who come into the health centers and you know hope talks to them and they're like she's like that's interesting that you have an iep and they've never given you any services or that's interesting that they suspended you and you haven't gone to school in three months maybe you should talk to our lawyer um housing conditions so we don't do eviction work as you hear from susie bread you know eviction is their bread and butter sorry not a pun no pun intended um but um housing conditions we kind of have a niche practice there where we because that those are so um tied to to especially with kids with asthma health harming you know legal needs we really do a lot of work around housing conditions and reasonable accommodations for kids uh for families and housing we do some public benefits work, not so much the traditional public benefits work of like SNAP and TANF, though we do get referrals around that. We mostly partner there. We do some SSI work in that area. And then we do work where like Medicaid isn't giving families what they need or Medicaid has been turned off for families in weird ways. Um, and then a little bit of family law guardianship for adults, uh, like adult children who like just turned 18. I mean, the adult may need to get guardianship of them. Um, some powers of attorney, those types of issues. But our main buckets for pro bono are going to be in the education and housing conditions arena. 
I'm going to turn it over to Hope, who's going to give you the virtual tour since we can't show you in person of our beautiful facility. Uh, sounds good. And so before I go through the slides, I did just want to reiterate a couple of things and provide a couple of scenarios that are quite common, as uh, Kathy has, has mentioned. So as uh, general pediatricians or community pediatricians with children, we practice a lot of social medicine and that we realize the impact that we can have just as a loan provider pales in comparison to what we can do if we have effective partnerships like that, um, which we have with Children's Law Center. We like to think of ourselves as one primary care location in, in, in many different parts of the city. And so we do have two uh, health centers east of the river and three um, on the other side of town. Collectively, we see about 100,000 visits per year. And we also operate something called the medical mobile unit, which I've been tasked to kind of get up and running. And so that's going to be going out into the community more and more. Um, and so, of course, the families that we are reaching definitely need um, uh, quite a bit of support. And Children's Law has really been able to to, um, help with that. So one common scenario that hits many different areas is that of asthma. Um, so if you see a kiddo who's constantly in the emergency room or has been hospitalized many, many times, um, despite optimal medication management, despite seeing uh, a, even a subspecialist, um, when you get that social history, you might understand that there are suboptimal living conditions that definitely impact the health outcome of that asthmatic, things like a moldy um, basic apartment that they're living in or rodents or roaches. Um, and so again, I could prescribe as much medication as I possibly can. I can see that kid every three months um, on cue, but they're going to continue to go to the ER, continue to be hospitalized, kind of taxing the system. Um, the kiddo is going to continue to miss school. The parents are going to continue to miss work unless we do something about some of those social situations. Um, and referral to the Children's Law Center, I've seen it work personally, has improved the outcome um, for, for those for those kids. So housing advocacy is huge. Uh, Kathy also mentioned navigating the school system. So I'd like for you to consider, and I, get, I have these cases personally, um, the autistic kid um, with a uh, elderly guardian um, with a third or fifth grade education who just cannot navigate the school system and cannot navigate this very complex medical system. Um, and so we pull in the Children's Law S Center to do things like get the kid an appropriate IEP, make sure that the school is meeting their needs. And then Kathy also um, and, and the team also helps us with things like, you know, she mentioned, I might not be able to write an effective letter of medical necessity um, to get this kid evaluated in, a, in an effective manner, but um, Children's Law Center can help us. And over the years, we've come to really, really appreciate um, how they help us to help the families. Um, so just a, a priceless, priceless resource to have um, embedded into the primary care uh, location. I can send them a message at 10 and by 12, I'm probably getting a response um, of, of how, to, how they're going to reach out to the family. So this is our Anacostia location. Um, so we're lucky that over the past mm, four years, we've had two brand spanking new primary care uh, locations um, in the east of the river corridor, um, which has really um, helped to elevate um, the, the care that we give. I mean, it's nice when um, you can come to a pediatrician's office and it's, and it's nice. Um, um, and so this is the children's uh, at uh, the big chair, which we call children's at Anacostia. Next slide. Uh, this is our medical director, Dr. Sahira Long, and associate medical director at the Anacostia location, Candace Dawes. Um, and Dr. Long has probably been a part of uh, the, the primary care department as long as Kathy has, has been there as well, if not, if not longer. Um, next slide. I'm and so, this is, I'm so yeah, embedded that my kids go to the doctor there now too. So it's a real medical legal partnership. Absolutely. And um, we have a drive up vaccine clinic that we were doing uh, uh, flu vaccines and other things external to the brick and mortar location. And Kathy uh, brought her kids there to the drive up mobile unit clinic. So she definitely makes use of it. And this is our location um, over at the ARC, which we like to think of as cross pollination. It's a very awesome, it's a great model where um, not only do we have Children's Law Center, but we have, um, you know, uh, 
things in place to address food insecurity and things in, in place to address, um, you know, mindfulness and transcendental meditation. So it's just, you know, a lot of different resources that we have in place in order to really impact the health outcomes for children um, east of the Anacostia River. Next slide. And I think this is one of our longstanding providers, Dr. Lewis Ragland, who does a lot of things around heart health, um, also refers to the Children's Law Center. So just giving you a snapshot of kind of the things that we do, but I, I can't reiterate enough um, that this is such a priceless resource to have embedded right inside of the primary care location. These are just some of the um, like kit, actually some of the doctors, Dr. Bodrick, I see who was previously at Unity is now at, um, at the ARC, but we just wanted to highlight these are some of the kids and families that we have worked with over the years. Um, and I think, you know, we like to give you the virtual tour because I think um, just to highlight like these are really amazing physical offices and like they're really like children's provides extremely high quality care to all of the patient families. Whenever I give the tour, I'm like, it's a doctor's office. My kids come here, but also it just, it's probably nicer than the actual physical doctor's office I get to go to for myself. Um, and they're beautiful spaces and um, you know, the doctors are all wonderful partners. So I'm gonna turn it over to, to the Bread for the City team to talk about their work now and highlight their brand new space, but I wanted to thank um, Hope for joining us. And I know you might have to jump off, but thank you again for your time um, today and for your wonderful partnership for all of your time at Children. So thank you. Thanks everybody. Happy to answer any questions virtually if necessary. Thanks, Kathy. Thank Well, great, great. That was really good. Thank you so much for sharing that wonderful presentation. That was a phenomenal presentation. And I know a lot more than what I did know about the Children's Law Center. So thank you so much. Um, I'm Kenrick Thomas. I'm the Communications and Events Manager with Bread for the City. And I've been with Bread for the City for about two months now, going on three months. And I'm really excited that everyone is here. And I'm really excited to be able to present to you and show you a lot of information about Bread for the City and what it is that we do for the community. Before I start speaking, I'm actually gonna share a video with you that's pretty much gonna give you an overview of Bread for the City on where we started and where we are now. Thank you. 
that video pretty much gives you an idea about Bread for the City and how we got started and where we are now. As you can see in the video, we are extremely excited for our new location that we have in Anacostia, which is 1700 Good Hope Road. It's over, the video says 27,000 square feet, but we actually found out actually when we were getting closer to our grand opening that it's actually over 28,000 square feet, which we're extremely excited about. And it's something that is really gonna just be able to help us serve so many more clients east of the river. Bread for the City, I would like to say we're more like a one-stop shop. So a lot of our clients that come to Bread for the City, they may come to us for our food pantry, they may come for our clothing program, but while they're there, they're also able to stop and go to our medical clinic. And they're also able to utilize some of our social services programs that we have. And that's one of the amazing things about Bread for the City is that our clients really, when they come to us, we're, we're trying to take care of all their needs all at once. A lot of people, when they hear the name Bread for the City, they think of our food pr food pantry. And a lot of the times that's all they think of because I guess maybe the name Bread, Bread for the City. And that's how we got started. And, but to tell you the truth, our food pantry is one of the most utilized programs that we have, but we have tons of others. Our food pantry actually has been around for such a very long time. We've actually have been serving clients over, I believe we have over 3000 clients that we serve each month. And it's something that pretty much a lot of households in Washington, DC, preferably east of the river rely on because of the, the op, because of the lack of opportunities that are actually in Anacostia. If you're not a, aware of, of Anacostia, it's actually in a food desert. So a lot of the clients that live in Anacostia, they really don't have access to quality food. The, the nearest grocery store may be a 20 minute drive. And so what happens is a lot of the residents in that area, they have to rely on corner stores and which can lead to unhealthy eating which is something that we don't really wanna have our clients relying on. So our food pantry is really reliable because they're able to come to us and they're able to get food. And the great thing about our food pantry is that it's just not just food, it's actually healthy food. So we're not giving our clients food that's high in sodium. We actually have food that's low in sodium. We actually give them fresh produce, which is an, another amazing thing. We wanna make sure that when they actually come to our food pantry, that we're not just giving them any kind of food, we're giving them healthy food because we don't wanna give them food that's gonna be health, that's gonna be unhealthy, that's gonna pretty much lead to a lot of health issues, which is kind of defeating the purpose of Bread for the City. We wanna make sure our clients, when they come to us, they're actually getting that grocery store feel. They're actually able to have their choice of food and they're able to get healthy food that they're gonna be able to have for their family. Also, our clothing program. Right now, currently, our, our clothing program is actually on hold due to COVID-19, but once everything starts to calm down, we're actually going to open it back up. And this is a, a store that a lot of people rely on in the community because they actually don't have access to a lot of stores to be able to get clothes, or they may not actually have the resources or funds to be able to purchase clothes. Some of our clients have out of use. Also, too, we just don't want to close our clothing program. We also offer all the stuff. We also offer lotion and soap and towels and also books as well. Something that's really helpful to our clients, something that they rely on. And that's something that we're happy with. And also, too, once the location opens up and we're actually able to offer our we're going to be accepting locations from the community to be able to provide those programs and provide those services and those products. As far as which is something we're really excited about because our medical clinic is actually the first time we're going to be offering comprehensive medical care east of the Anacostia River, which is something that we're really excited about. Before, we only had our medical program. So our residents in Anacostia were They actually have to travel all the way to Northwest to be able to go to our medical center. But now because we're actually gonna be offering a medical center in Anacostia and in Ward 7 and Ward 8, 
they're going to actually be able to go there and be able to get quality medical care, but not just quality medical care. They're going to be able to get dental care as well, and also behavior health services as well, and also vision care. And we're going to be also offering them a fitness center, which is another thing that we're really excited about. We also have another thing we're really excited about is also our diaper program we also provide. Before COVID-19, we would have a lot of families that would come to our center and they would pick up diapers for their children. But now because of COVID-19, we've partnered with another organization and we're able to deliver those diapers to the actual community. So we're able to actually go to their house and provide them with diapers so they don't actually have to leave their home and to be able to risk themselves getting COVID-19. They're actually able to come to their front door and get, a, and get diapers, which is something we're really happy about as well. We also offer a representative payee program. A lot of the times our clients, they may receive money, but a lot of the times they struggle with budgeting and how to be able to pay their bills and all at the same time and be able to actually have money left aside to be able to get other products that they may need or other services they may need. So we actually have a representative payee program that actually helps them to be able to budget their money whenever they're actually, whenever they get paid. And it's something that we're really excited about because a lot of our clients, they're able to take this program and they're able to learn. And so what happens is a lot of our clients don't actually stay on the representative payee program for a long time because as they're involved in this program, they're also learning budgeting skills. And then so they once, they're, once they learn that skill, they're able to come off the representative payee program and they're actually able to utilize the, the, the knowledge that they've learned in this program to be able to budget their money, which is another thing that we're also excited about. And so that's one of the things we're really happy. I won't take up too much of your, too much of your time. I wanted to actually show you some pictures of actually our new center that we actually have. So this is actually a picture of our new Southeast Center. So as you can see in the bottom right here in the corner, that's actually our food pantry. And that, it looks like an actual grocery store. And that was one of the models that we were looking into. We wanted to actually make sure that our clients come to our food pantry, that they actually have a choice of food. We're not just handing them a bag of groceries because what happens is some of our clients don't eat everything that's in the bag because they may not like it or they may have an allergy. So now when they come to our food pantry, they actually have a choice of what they want and they can pick it out themselves. Also on top of that photo, that's a picture of our brand new lobby that we have. So when our clients come in, it's a nice waiting center. Um, you can't see it, but there's also chairs there on the other side where they're able to sit and they're able to wait, whether they're waiting for the intakes, intake uh, coordinator, whether they're waiting for our food pantry or whether they're waiting to go into our, our actual our clothing program. Across from that photo, that's actually a picture of our dental room which is really great. We're really excited about that. We're gonna be having a lot of clients east of the river that's going to be utilizing that service. And also on, on, at the bottom, that's actually a picture of front of the building. Um, this is a brand new building. We're actually right now working on a strategic plan on how we're gonna be able to move everyone into the building from across the street, which is where our old center is, and how we're gonna be able to open up this center to the community so people will be able to actually come to our new facility and to receive services. And also what I'm going to do is I'm also going to show you a picture of also our Northwest Center as well. And this is a picture of our Northwest Center. At the, the top left hand corner, that's the front of the building, which is also um, exciting because when we first purchased this building, we only had a small portion of it, which I don't believe you actually can see in this photo, but as time went along, we actually was able to expand our Northwest Center, which allowed us to be able to provide more services as well. Across from that photo, that's actually a picture of our food pantry in the Northwest Center. So we, we have a food pantry east of the river, and we also have a food pantry in our Northwest Center as well. So it's really accommodating for low-income families in Washington, D.C. At the bottom, that's also a picture of Dr. Miles, who's also head of our dental clinic. And then also across from that picture, we also have our volunteers who come in on a consistent basis every day working, preparing grocery bags, preparing our clients to be able to come in and making sure that they're well taken care of, which is something that we're really excited about. And right now I'm gonna turn it over to Susie, who's actually head of our legal clinic, and she's gonna tell you a little bit about that. Thanks, Kendrick. So the Breakfast City Legal Clinic, uh, a lot 
bigger than when I started 20 years ago as a family law attorney. There were just three attorneys at the time. And so now we have 17 attorneys and five uh, non-attorney staff. And we help DC residents um, who are at or below 200% of the poverty level and help them with housing, family law, immigration, and public benefit matters. And so in our housing practice, we are helping, Kathy made reference to it, um, support tenants uh, fight evictions and landlord tenant court. We're helping them fight terminations of really critical housing subsidies where it's the only way they can live in the city um, with high rents because their rent is based on their income. And we also do work, what we call building work. Uh, so it's representing tenant associations and groups of tenants, helping them obtain and preserve safe and affordable housing. In our family practice, we represent primarily survivors of domestic violence and getting protective orders against batterers, and then helping them with related family law matters like divorce, custody, child support. We have a small immigration practice where we help non-citizen uh, district residents uh, who are survivors of domestic, sexual, and family violence obtain immigration relief. And the last main area of work that we do in the legal clinic is in the area of public benefits. So it's helping district residents obtain and maintain critical safety net benefits, food stamps, Medicaid, um, temporary assistance for needy families, which is a cash assistance program. Uh, and um, we, we have started working in this area um, regarding the home health air, um, care hours that are needed by residents who are elderly or have a disability. And so what's great about our legal clinic, um, you've heard from Kenrick that we are part of this larger organization that provides an array of services under one roof. Um, and so in some sense, I guess we have lots of partnerships, you know, we have a medical legal partnership, we have a food pantry legal partnership, we have a social services legal partnership. And so it's something that really um, is a way to serve our client community. Um, most of our clients don't come with just one discrete issue, particularly in Ward 7 and 8. Um, you know, Kathy made reference to the structural racism that our city residents have suffered, particularly in those two wards. And so due to those, the decades of disinvestment and neglect, um, our clients really are facing multiple challenges. And so the legal clinic, um, we are fortunate that we can collaborate with our medical providers, our social workers, and take advantage of their different skill sets and knowledge. Uh, we are able to obtain legal outcomes that uh, we believe are more comprehensive, beneficial um, to our clients and families, thanks to those collaborations. You know, Kathy talked about, and Dr. Rose talked about um, the medical legal partnerships. And at Bradford City, again, we have kind of multiple partnerships and we work closely with our medical providers, but also our social, social workers. Um, they are helping us with different things, you know, crisis intervention, uh, you know, helping us understand systems we're less familiar with, like the mental health system in the district. And so, um, and with the support of our social workers, um, we can better understand our clients' emotional health and needs, and they offer um, guidance on how we can help our clients um, more fully participate in their legal case. Uh, the example that I like to give as, to illustrate this is we had a client who dealt with a lot of severe anxiety and his legal case was not helping that. And we got to the point where there was a filing deadline. We needed to hear from our client what steps he wanted to take. And he just, there was so much anxiety wrapped up around the case. He just could not communicate with us anymore about the case. So we're wondering what we do. We need to zealously advocate for our client. We need to meet these filing deadlines. And so we consulted with our social worker who was like, hey, why don't you just try giving him a call a couple of times absolutely do not talk about the legal case. Just check in on him and have a conversation. And sure enough, by the third or fourth call, our client himself raised the legal case and was in a place where he could talk about what steps he wants to take in that case. And so we're really grateful that we have that kind of support um, within our organization so that we can better serve our clients. Um, and then obviously, you know, what is beneficial to our client community is that you know, our patients, our social services and food clients are able to connect with lawyers um, in 
in situations where maybe otherwise they would not have sought free legal services. Um, Kathy mentioned trust and relationships, it's so important. And um, because our clients and other bread programs have developed that trust, we can kind of more easily be able to connect and be able to support um, our clients and our various bread facility programs. You know, another example is, for example, we, you heard about the medical legal partnerships and how that works. In our food program, for example, if someone came in, they're picking up food and they mentioned to the food program staff, I'm having trouble with food stamps. That staff member can directly refer that client to our legal clinic that, that day. And if for some reason it's not convenient for the client to meet with the legal staff person, then the Bread for the City food program staff can just input information, of course, with the client's consent to um, have the legal clinic contact that food program client at a later time. And so we're really lucky that we are able to have a multi-serve, be part of a multi-service organization and create efficiencies, um, achieve better legal outcomes, and also, um, you know, minimize the emotional and financial toll that community members often have to deal with um, when seeking specialized help. So I think now you've heard enough of me talking. Um, I'm going to actually pose some questions to you guys in the audience, make sure you're listening. And um, Kenrick's actually going to uh, post some questions. We're going to have you guys take a guess at answers. If I think I see some of you who are in the legal services field. So if you know the answers, maybe um, step back a little bit. And you can put your answers in the chat and we can all see what we think about some of these situations that our client community is facing. And so the first question I wanted to pose to you all is how many cases are filed by landlords against tenants in landlord tenant court each year? And if you guys could just put your answers in the chat, I would love to see your thoughts on that. In a non-COVID year, right? In a non-COVID year, yes. Do people have access to the chat? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ada. Anyone want to take a guess? No guesses? Oh, okay. Thanks, Christina. That's a lot. <laughs> 50,000, 30,000. Okay. All right. Well, some of you are quite close. It's annually, it's over 30,000 every year. Um, and so that's a lot of cases fought against tenants. And okay. so my next question is, what percentage of landlords in landlord tenant court are represented by an attorney? And then what percentage of tenants are represented by an attorney? And you can put that in the chat as well. Thanks, I appreciate everyone's participation. 90, 30, 85, okay, 95, 85, 25, okay. Yeah, a lot of you are um, really close. So it's about 95% of landlords who are represented by counsel in landlord tenant court and their cases against tenants. And um, only about 10% of tenants are represented by attorneys. And most of those are thanks to civil legal service providers providing free legal help. Okay, so next question. This is in our domestic violence division in DC Spirit Court. So what's, um, what are people's thoughts on what percentage of petitioners in civil protection order cases are represented by an attorney? And you can put that in the chat. Ten percent. Okay. Any other thoughts? Twenty percent. So it the answer is twelve percent of petitioners seeking a protection order are represented by counsel, and that's based on um, court data from two thousand seventeen. And then the last question I will pose to y'all is um, about the Office of Administrative Hearing. So that's the part, um, the entity where uh, 
appeals are filed if a resident is unhappy with the decision made by a government agency regarding their safety net benefit, food stamps, Medicaid, TANF. And so in this, um, at OAH, um, with respect to public benefits cases, what is the percentage of cases in which no party was represented by an attorney? Ninety-five, ninety, ninety. Okay, you guys are close. So the answer here is eighty-six percent of these cases there are um, had no party represented. Again, based on uh, data from two thousand seventeen. All right. So many of you, I think, are already aware that we need um, pro bono attorneys to help us out here. The civil legal services community cannot meet the need in these cases where there is so much at stake, at stake and unfortunately there is no right to an attorney in these types of cases. And we need pro bono attorneys help um, not only to increase access to justice but also to seek racial justice. In the parts of the court that Children's Law Center and Bradford City practice in, black and brown litigants make up a majority of the unrepresented litigants who are living with low income and cannot afford an attorney. And so we need pro bono attorneys to help us mitigate those racial inequities that are currently present in our legal system. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Kenrick to show a brief video about Bradford City's pro bono volunteers, and then we'll turn it over to Jen from the Children's Law Center to talk more about um, pro bono work, um, the impact, and how organizations like ours can support pro bono attorneys. Kendrick, there's no sound. You may need to unmute yourself, Kendrick. Okay, I think I have to, okay, I think this should work now. Let's see. I'll start it over. Breath to the City depends on pro bono attorneys to help provide the legal help district residents need to secure access to justice and basic human needs. To live in a safe, affordable home, to live in a home free of violence, and to provide access to food and medical care. I view pro bono work as an essential part of my practice. Um, it's a part of my practice where I get to do things that I don't normally do in my practice, but they're very, very important things. And I get to help people that really need the legal help and probably wouldn't get the help elsewhere if I weren't there to provide it. And that's a very important thing. And that makes me feel very, very good. Um, my experience with the Bread for the City attorneys is that they're both extraordinarily skilled attorneys and extremely willing to work with you so that you can get the work done in a way that needs to be done. Help They help me out with issues that I'm not as familiar with, with respect to the local courts and so forth. And I've had a great experience to working with them. Hi, I'm Eleanor Wade, and I'm an attorney at the Legal Clinic at Bread for the City. I want to give a special thanks and recognition to Elise Pathkin, one of our pro bono attorney volunteers at the Legal Clinic. A little over a year ago, the Legal Clinic started taking cases for people who had their long-term care benefits reduced under DC Medicaid. The Legal Clinic's public benefits practice started taking these cases as we saw an uptick in them. And we really needed support, not only to help us with the cases, but also to help us research the issues and learn what we really needed to do to make sure our clients got good outcomes. When Elise took a case from us, she was so compassionate and so diligent and so curious about learning about the client and learning about the entire process. And she also really went Okay, sorry about that. I'm not sure what quite happened. Let's see. Looks like there's an error that took place. Sorry about that. 
That's okay. I can just tell you that Eleanor is going to say that Elise was wonderful. She really um, cared about the client. And I think the piece that you didn't hear was just that um, not only does she help this client with one case, but then another legal issue came up and um, she took that on because she cared so much about the client. So we really appreciate that dedication. And we're going to turn over to Jen now. Thanks so much, Susie and Kenrick. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again and just take us back to the slides for a moment. Um, thank you everyone for joining us as we've been talking today. Of course, we um, have talked about how we co-locate services, how we're serving clients east of the Anacostia River and the legal needs that our clients are facing. So as you were hearing from Susie just a moment ago, um, and through that video as well, pro bono really matters. It makes a big difference. When you look at the statistics of litigants unrepresented without a right to counsel in crucial matters that are impacting their daily lives, um, the reality is that having a lawyer and having a pro bono volunteer, even if you haven't had a lot of experience and it's your first time taking on a case, the difference between having a lawyer and not having one is critical. And so this is my you can do it slide. There is a real need and you can make a real difference by using your legal talents and partnering with the amazing clients who we serve who are the experts in their lives and partnering with them with our legal skills can make all the difference to secure good outcomes. There are professional benefits as well. And so in talking with pro bono volunteers, we know that our opportunities offer a lot of hands-on lawyering. You may have a stand-up court experience if that's something that you're looking for. You may have other informal advocacy opportunities. Ultimately, having concrete results for families is an incredibly rewarding experience and offered by the pro bono opportunities that we have. The types of cases, again, you heard a lot about our medical legal partnership today where we're getting those education and housing conditions referrals that Kathy mentioned earlier. We're also practicing in family law. So we're representing kids who are caught in high conflict custody cases as their guardian ad litem best interest attorney. And we're representing third party caregivers who are seeking to provide children with stable homes. When you think about the medical legal partnership that we've been discussing today, it is that pathway from a doctor to a lawyer. So you heard Kathy talk about this process and being able to identify the non-medical barriers to a child's health is critical and it's been a successful partnership and these are the cases that we are receiving at Children's Law Center but can't fully staff because we're at capacity in-house. And so that is where we're relying on volunteers to assist us. And when the referrals come our way, you'll see the last step here after we're doing an intake with the client is to assess how we can help. And so that's one of the supports that we provide our pro bono volunteers is we are screening our cases. We're looking at them with an eye toward, is this something that requires our expertise? Is this something that a pro bono volunteer with no or limited experience would be successful um, working with the client? And I'm happy to say that our cases are um, able to be placed with pro bono lawyers at a really high rate. And so we screen them and then we offer mentoring and training supports. And you can find resources on our website. So we have a series of on-demand trainings that we did after the pandemic to be able to account for how we're advocating remotely. And I'm happy to say we're able to do that. We've been able to pivot during the pandemic and meet our clients um, in the digital space to be able to advocate for them. And you can find those trainings and other resources on our website to support you. Also, Jen, I, don't, sorry, Jen, I don't know if you just want to mention like in terms of our housing conditions cases, at least like that court's back up and running. So for people interested in sort of court that like appearances, like you can do virtual court that way right now. Absolutely. Um, so there, there's definitely remote hearings happening in family law cases as well as housing conditions. So, and those are coming up because we've had a lot of experience. And here, you know, this list about getting involved with us. We have a list of share opportunities. We have the trainings that I just referenced on demand. And then once we find a case that's a good fit, we do offer mentoring. So you could hear from Kathy directly, for example, as one of our mentors at CLC, about what that remote hearing process looks like. Um, so I want to go ahead and just thank you again for joining us. I know that we are at the end of our time. And so um, thank you so much for joining us today and um, certainly thinking about pro bono, the work that we're doing at our respective organizations. We'd be happy to engage any questions.